Yes. There we go. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. You can see uh, the screen OK, Ruth? Yes. It's cool. good. Thank you. I had a little right. little glitch in getting it open there. So thank you, Ruth and the GIS team for having me. And thank you guys all for, for being here and kind of listening to, to what we're doing um, with GIS and with data in general um, as it relates to COVID-19 with um, public health and EMS. My name is Andrew Casey. I am a part of our kind of our clinical management team here at EMS and our, our primary day-to-day -day work is really Mine, at least, is more related to the to what paramedics do when they show up to a 911 call and, and how they take care of you from a clinical standpoint. Um, that that role is largely data driven and that we uh, are are continuously analyzing data and um, uh, to kind of monitor performance and find places where we should improve. Um, and there's another piece to our agency that is very um, oriented around kind of connecting the different parts of the healthcare system and protecting or not protecting but supporting them and preparing for disaster or or problems that impact the whole system and kind of connecting and coordinating all the pieces when things like this come up so my position being kind of rel very data oriented plus our role of kind of coordinating healthcare efforts uh sort of led to me being in this position of connecting our EMS data, public health and epidemiology data, um, and EMS system data all into one view um, to kind of monitor COVID as time goes on. So that's a little bit about me and kind of how I got here uh, into this position in the middle of uh, COVID data for, for EMS and public health. So um, thank you again for being here and here into our, here in our uh, talk today. So the, I think I'll start with just this overview I have this PowerPoint. I'll go pretty quickly through it um, so that we can actually just see the, the 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 work that's been done in action and kind of what we're doing. But I'll start with a little overview here regarding kind of just how this all evolved. So you have a little bit of context. So the beginning, there was I think there were probably regular phone calls about COVID since the early January, and and I wasn't even engaged in it at that point in time. Um, but then COVID got here, and there became this need to understand the situation to figure out what it is we even need to be looking at how we respond to this sort of thing what we should be monitoring day in day out uh, and really just understand the situation beyond that we knew there would be a need to kind of monitor the situation going forward as we've seen recently where COVID numbers are going up right now um, but just a couple months ago we were kind of in our in a good looking spot for the first time in a little while so we needed some way of monitoring things as time went on to kind of alert us when things were changing as early as possible. Um, and then we've needed uh, a big part of this is reopening and monitoring data in a way that allows us to um, fulfill the state guidelines and, and kind of measure how we're meeting those those metrics in terms of reopening and um, how we can do that and leveraging uh, data so that we we can reopen at a at a good rate and and support our community being safe at the same time. So that's there's a lot that goes into this. Um, largely, just we have sensitive data, we have data that needs to be very secure, we have data that needs to be very public, and we have a constantly changing need for what data we need to watch and what the state guidelines are and what data we 
are relying on to sort of respond to the whole situation and support our healthcare system. So it is a tough environment to be working in, I think. Um, but the GIS solutions we've been able to use have been really great. Nothing, not that much of what we done have done is super, super fancy or incredibly, I won't say it's not technical, uh, but it's not um, super fancy GIS work. It's using tools that GIS offers to accomplish really important but relatively straightforward tasks that need to happen around the clock day in day out to monitor and understand COVID better. So we'll go through them a little bit kind of in uh, in order of how it's all evolved. So the first few slides you'll see here are the early phases of us and this was actually I was not so much involved in this. This was our epidemiology team who couldn't be on today, um, but they and the GIS team and uh, Eric Alter specifically sort of went through and have throughout the whole uh, pandemic gone through and, and done some of these mapping efforts to, to better understand COVID-19. So of course, everybody's seen maps of, of COVID and dots all over the place showing who has it, who doesn't, that sort of thing. And here back in April, and I think even earlier in March, that was sort of one of the initial efforts to start to get our bearings in terms of we know that COVID is now here, but what does that actually look like? So here's one sample of an initial uh, heat map we put our air put together for us to sort of evaluate where COVID was and where it was going. We do these, um, I'm calling it a status check here, but we do these sort of check ins and remapping of where COVID's been, where recovered patients are, where there's deaths, where where the most active patients are and try to try to um, sort of target our efforts there's a lot going on particularly as reopening started there's huge amounts of effort that have to happen to identify outbreaks early so for instance we we found we've had a number of outbreaks at congregant living uh, centers in which case we deploy a whole team of people out there to start testing everybody who works in or lives in that facility um, so there's a, a need to kind of check in and do these maps on a regular basis to see what's going on um, where we have our positive patients and what communities are being hit the hardest. Uh, that's really key, particularly as reopening started. In the early phases, it was really, let's figure out what's going on. Let's figure out how fast it's spreading. Let's maybe target some communities to try to slow the spread down. But um, really, as reopening happened, I think that's probably where that became the, the bigger effort was, as we know COVID will start to spread again, so how can we target particular communities or areas to um, with community outreach and testing sites and other efforts to sort of support them since they're most at risk during the, the, the reopening and that spread increases again. So that brings me to my next point that these maps have been pretty vital in, both of which are related to state metrics and meeting the defined guidelines for reopening and supporting the community to, to reopen safely. So that those are the two maps you see here um, are examples of that. The this map here on the um, on the left side, I'm sorry, with the with the yellow dots was really early on in the whole process. Part of our initial attestation to the state to say, hey, we think we are monitoring our data well, we think we're doing well, and we think um, some amount of reopening is reasonable. Part of that whole requirement and that attestation was proving that we had certain percentages of the community within five miles of a testing site and this GIS um, effort to produce this map that you see here on the left side um, was ultimately the tool that allowed us to to show that and to and to begin the reopening uh, process early on um, which which was appropriate and very beneficial so it's hugely impactful in something like this obviously there's major health concerns there's huge economic concerns there's this is impactful stuff to what we do and, and how we handle this. And truthfully, without a tool like this to be able to measure um, things like testing sites within a certain distance from people's homes, I really don't know. I, I don't think we would have much of a mechanism for going around about framing the situation in a way and sort of deciding how to uh, proceed based on that. So this has been hugely beneficial. Over here on the right side, you see another sample of a map. Um, that is for our current, it, it relate was when our we first switched to the tiered guidelines, which we kind of, we currently have. Um, 
and the health equity metric. So the health equity metric sort of requires that we have uh, positivity rates that are equitable, that we don't reopen as a county or we don't look good as a county because our well-to-do areas with lots of resources are doing great. Meanwhile, our um, more disadvantaged areas are, are really struggling and being hit hard by COVID. Um, that's the state's guideline and the map on the right helps define the census tracts and the areas that um, that we need to be watching closely to meet that health metric and, and help us target um, community outreach and, and and testing days and whatnot in those areas to help prevent the spread for those less advantaged areas. That coupled with maps like you saw on the previous slide here, um, specific to those areas has really helped us monitor the health equity metric and um, continue to kind of reopen safely and, and meet state guidelines, which we've been quite, quite successful in. Our next, um, the next sort of step after that, the mapping's been going on throughout, obviously, being able to visualize geographically where COVID is and what it's doing um, is a pretty, a pretty key part of this. So that happened early just to get a sense of what was happening. That's happened on an ongoing basis since then. Um, but there were some other needs that came up pretty early on. And the first was the need for, to put together some sort of a picture um, that, that took, that took the status of the situation and put data from numerous into one picture so that we could sort of watch the situation each day, day and out, day out for more operational decision making. So this is more from an EMS standpoint, rather than tracking spread so much and trying to monitor what COVID's doing, that's a piece of this. Uh, but the bigger part here really was our role in supporting the healthcare system during this. So monitoring the status of any given hospital, of our ambulance services, of our fire departments, even to some extent our law enforcement agencies, um, our whole 911 system and the hospitals connected to them, monitoring kind of the status of that to see to, in a way that would allow us to recognize we may need to intervene and help this hospital or this agency or this group or or at least um, coordinate with them how to uh, make some changes to limit risk if if things are not looking good for them. So that was kind of the goal is how can we day in, day out monitor the status of um, COVID as it relates to uh, resources, hospitals, staff, communities and the actual virus and the spread of it itself. This is really hard. You'll see on the next slide, it's a little bit of a mess, but this is this is tough. This is actually not, it's not a huge technical challenge, I don't think, um, though I would leave that to the GIS team to kind of speak to you more since they, they're the ones uh, responsible for the technical aspect of this. Maybe, maybe there's more to it than I give credit for, but um, the reality is we have a lot of tools already to do this every day. That's part of our job is to monitor the status of the system and whatnot. Um, but we haven't had to do it quite like this, at least not in my experience. So we have tons and tons of data sources, lots of data sources, most of them relevant in some way, but getting them and compiling them all into one place to give us the right picture day in, day out and keeping that data current would be a big challenge. Uh, further, not knowing exactly what we needed to be looking at and having what we needed to be watching or monitoring in terms of data change on a regular basis. We have frequent, frequent inquiry, inquiries from all sorts of um, organizations regarding different data. Um, and certainly the state requirements have changed numerous times. So we needed something really flexible. We needed something numerous people could access and we needed something really secure. So to have something takes numerous sources, puts it into one place without overworking everybody even more manually getting that data um, while also keeping it very secure, but then again, making it public and sharing it with numerous internal folks that a lot of it's a big kind of contradictory challenge. So we knew we needed a dashboard of sorts. That's the right um, solution here. We need a picture. We need a picture of what's going on in the world as, as it relates to COVID every day and it needs to be updated. Um, and so this is kind of the solution that, that we had. So we have 
these are all our data sources over here. Image Trend Elite is our uh, EMS patient record data. Biospatial does some analysis from that. It's a tool that we have access to. CalReady obviously is the state's um, database for uh, reportable diseases. Snowflake is not a data source so much as a tool of getting the data to us, and that's also from the state uh, getting data from hospitals each day and uh, even nursing facilities regarding the resources that they have. ReadyNet has been our sort of huge, um, I won't say that, has been a blessing for us throughout this whole thing. So one issue, which is fair, is that the data through Snowflake uh, regarding how many beds are available at the hospital, how many COVID patients are in the hospital, we get that there. We also get that through ReadyNet. ReadyNet's a tool that we had we already use and has been established and, and, and kind of relied on by us day in, day out, most days, but we were able to adapt to fit uh, the specific needs of COVID when this all started. Um, so the advantage there is we get an update from hospitals every morning regarding how many beds they have available, how many COVID patients they have in the ICU, how many they have in the hospital um, every day. And we get that current day data by generally 9.30 in the morning, which is fantastic. Further, we were able to get um, ReadyNet and the GIS team helped us to set up a FTP server that would allow that data to be kind of streamlined right into the database as opposed to being manually pulled out like it was initially. So um, ReadyNet has really been a big advantage for us in monitoring the status of hospitals, um, both in the service it provides, but also how well it's been able to streamline getting data to us. Um, that's been pretty key and it's something a lot of counties haven't been able to do. Using only the state provided data through Snowflake, we would have the same measures and actually a lot more. There's, there's really fantastic data that comes through that source, but it's delayed. We would always be projecting out to the public and, and using internally for operational decisions, we'd be using data that was two, to, two days old, basically. Uh, whereas with ReadyNet, we're getting current day data updated every single day, put into our dashboard for a fresh picture. The other thing I'll point out about this is all these data sources are pouring into either to, to us here at Public Health and EMS or directly into the Oracle database that the GIS team manages for us. Um, but there's a two way sort of connection between those two things. We're able to utilize things like Power Automate to streamline the process of moving data to the GIS team when that's the most efficient way to do it. Um, we're also able to plug into the Oracle database and view any data coming in there, which has been key for this whole thing. The, the um, number of sort of ad hoc analysis, I call them, uh, the amount of that that we need, the ability to dig into something, you know, our ICU numbers go up and the ability to just dig in in a new way to sort of understand why that is happening, um, to validate that that's true, uh, to answer some new question for uh, whatever stakeholder needs that question answered or that we need answered is huge. Um, I think I think that's oftentimes a barrier to uh, a department kind of going to an IT team and saying, hey, take our data and make this into something, is that sometimes it takes longer than to look at it in a new way or change how you're approaching it. So this ability to have um, both things happen at once us be able to analyze anything we need to on the fly while also having a more robust solution happen um, through the through the, uh, I, the GIS team has been a, a really a really huge thing and a huge advantage throughout this whole deal. So the next key to this whole thing is that we have internal public health and EMS folks that need to be looking at these dashboards and analyzing this data each day. We have stakeholders, we have uh, potentially fire departments, law enforcement agencies, hospitals themselves, uh, the public that need to be able to see certain data. Um, and we obviously this is patient information. This is sensitive data that we're working with. Um, so we had to be able to manage that somehow. And from Oracle, we there, there are the we have two different dashboards or a variety of different dashboards in another case. But in this case, for the operational dashboard, we have two separate views basically that sort of based on the person logging in and the permissions that they have i think permissions is the wrong term but the access that they have or the groups that they're part of in arcgis we can kind of control who can see what and limit access where we need to 
and and really keep that that data secure, living in the database, but projecting up to to the GIS dashboard. And that's been a, a huge key. If if we were not able to sort of project, show certain data to some folks and not to others, this this whole project would would really fail. That's a, a picture of the end result um, of the dashboard that we that we're referencing there. And this has had a lot of different um, pieces of data go into it uh, and kind of versions in terms of what you're what you see on the screen at any point in time. Um, we'll go through that online here after the PowerPoint, but that that is a, a picture of what it looks like at current, though it's changed a lot. And when I'll point out one of the really fantastic things about this was is um, that early on the demands with COVID didn't really sort of gradually creep up. It was, they were they were just here all of a sudden. Um, so we had to sort of figure out a solution while also responding to the problem, which is, is a challenge. It wasn't like, hey, in six months, we'd like to have this database built out to, to make this process run smoother. It was like, we've got a problem right now everybody is spending all of their time responding to and also need to build solutions to it to make that easier and, and, and to provide some longevity to the whole situation. So um, we kind of have been, well, it's, it's been fantastic in the way that when we need something with the GIS team, we've worked on it. And within a couple weeks, or I would say actually probably less than that, we have a solution running that then just continually evolves and improves over time to sort of perfect as things go on. We get the problem handled, and then we've gotten and perfecting as time goes on, which has really been key to be able to get things up and running that quickly. Um, and to establish a structure in the beginning where what you're seeing on the screen right now, we now, if we need to be looking at something totally different tomorrow, that could happen pretty easily. The data sources are plugged into this, the process is there. It's just a matter of sort of changing what's on the screen and how we how we analyze it. So some good work done early on there. Okay, and then the big, not the big, but yeah, it's the bigger part of this whole solution. This has been really, really key. <clears throat> so that that dashboard got us to a place and that whole process of getting the ReadyNet data and whatnot got us to a place where we were able to project in our public data, in our EMS system data, wherever we're providing data, we were able to provide daily updated with a decreased amount of manual effort, less at least, um, picture of hospital status, EMS system status, and COVID status, epidemiology data, to the public, to the hospitals, whoever we needed to do it to in the, in the, with the permissions or the uh, sort of uh, security level that we needed for each view. What we didn't have yet, or what we found recent, after, shortly after that was, okay, great. Every day we know how many patients are in the hospital. We know how many are in the ICU, awesome. But when things change, we have a hard time. How do we validate that? So from the data sources in that operational dashboard, we're getting N numbers. We're getting, there are 15 patients in my hospital. There's 20 in mine. There's 30 in mine. There's four in mine. When all of a sudden that four turns into a 15, is that an increase in COVID? Is that um, an error? What What's going on here? How do we validate that a little bit? So. We have ways, we have plenty of ways. We think we can we can build into the process things that kind of alert us when numbers change that much. We can pick up the phone and call the hospital. We can we we work very well as a team and as a group in that way. So it wasn't such an issue, but we realized we needed to better just overall understand this. We should be able to see the ICU numbers change, the hospitalized numbers change, and dig into show me the new people. Who are the new people that made that number change? And where did they come from? And what's going on with them? And how do we prevent them from needing to go to the hospital in the first place? Um, we needed to learn more about the hospitalized population. Uh, we needed to have some way of, of better validating the numbers we were getting, both from the state and from our local ReadyNet polls. And we wanted to take even further this process and make it not just another piece of work, not another ask, not something else we're going to the hospitals with. The amount of manually entered data that COVID has created is absolutely wild. There's a lot. 
the workload on hospitals and on all parts of the healthcare system to provide information are extreme. And it's it's problematic. The data gets less accurate. Um, and there's problems that come from that. There's a real, real fatigue there. So we wanted to take this and also turn it ultimately, eventually, into something that A, made the hospital's life hopefully easier, B, um, and, and wasn't an inc another thing to ask for, and B, maybe provided something back to them. So the other goal was clinical insights. If we were getting data about each patient from the hospital, we could then project back to them um, clinical insights in regards to the treatment being provided to different patients, those patients' outcomes. Um, they can see their own hospital's data, but then also aggregated data in that same way for the entire county and maybe learn from that, or at the very least, stimulate some conversation amongst the healthcare system about how to best care for these patients. So those were the goals. They come with a lot of challenges, but we've, we've found ways through most of them. The primary part of this, the simple way of explaining what this process really was, I call it the hospital data portal, what we're showing you right now. And the simplest explanation behind the big change here was we took what was this form on the left side, this piece of paper that was manually filled out by hospitals. When a patient gets a lab test in a hospital and it's positive for COVID, that has a couple things that happen. One, there's an electronic record that gets sent to, directly to the state and it, and it ends up in that state database. Two, this CMR form, this piece of paper was being faxed to us or sent to us and somebody was manually entering that data in and ultimately it was finding its way into the state database. And then we would see it again when it came back out of the state database and crunch that in with the rest of our, our uh, epidemiology numbers. There's a few problems with that. One, it's kind of labor intensive to be putting something on paper and then back into a computer. Two, there was a delay. By the time we would get this form, get that data into the state, the state would, whatever happens at that level, and then by the time we would get it back out to where we could now include in our daily numbers the number of hospitalized patients total um, and all these extra pieces of information about them like race, ethnicity, where they live, um, what their disposition ultimately was, it would take quite a while if it ever even got into the database. Um, so getting rid of this form and moving that to a survey one, two, three in ArcGIS was huge. It, first of all, um, meant that we weren't asking the hospital to do something they weren't already doing. We just we just slipped in an electronic form instead of this piece of paper. Two, it meant that we got that data right away. Instead of waiting for it to go through the state and come back to us, we got it right away for instant analysis um, to back up the aggregated numbers we were already getting every day, uh, which is huge. And then we provide this up to the state level and it ends up in the ReadyNet database and then it comes back to us in those numbers as well. So this is kind of the big change that happened with the data portal. It was an additional step replacing another uh, piece to the whole puzzle um, to sort of better understand and uh, validate the, the data that was in the dashboard. If anybody, if there are, if anybody has any questions or anything, we can, um, I'm certainly happy to pause and walk through those anytime. I know this is a, I talk really fast about this and I know that um, <laughs> that if, yeah, if you have not been in this whole process, that it's probably a lot. Yeah, Andrew, there was a, there was a question that came in. Sure. Um, CJ Farrar was asking uh, if you can give a, another specific example or description of how Power Automate is used to integrate GIS data. Yeah, so the simplest example I could give right now is that, or the, what's not kind of on the top of my head, is that, and it's not so specific to GIS, but that the uh, FTP server that ReadyNet moves data to every day, Power Automate is watching. And when that data changes, it grabs that and it moves it and stores it away for us, which can then be used as a uh, data source. So on, on my side of the world, that was happening um, early on. The GIS team in the Oracle database, I think have other ways of going about that. So I don't know that Power Automate's fixing, doing that solution. Um, but on my side, that Power Automate 
grabs that data every day, stores it in a place and moves it to a network drive where it is both available to the GIS team as well to me. Beyond that, this is an interesting solution. So Image Trend Elite is, a, um, is our EMS database. So every time there's a 911 call and a paramedic shows up and they um, contact a patient, they are, they're writing a report about their treatment and assessment, and um, that ends up in our tool, which is Image Trend. We can manually pull data from Image Trend. Um, I could go run a report right now and export a CSV and uh, um, use that data in whatever way I need, but we need to do that every day or multiple times a day um, and get it to the GIS team to feed that dashboard and to merge with other data. For example, we take that data and we merge it with um, the epidemiology data, CalReady data basically, and we look for any time our medics were on scene with a COVID positive patient and we monitor or evaluate what PPE they had on. And if they were, it was not a protected exposure, that person gets contacted and pulled out of the system to uh, prevent further exposure. So we have processes like that every day that happen from Image Trend Elite. And then I take data from there and move it to the GIS team every day. The way that that happens is um, I have reports scheduled that email to me, Power Automate watches that email. As soon as it sees it, it grabs that CSV file attached, moves it over to a folder that the GIS team has access to, and I have reports on my side as well as the dashboard on their side that then looks at those uh, CSV files as a data source. So th those are two examples there. Awesome, great. Thanks, I'll, I'll let you know if anything else comes through. Sounds good. OK, so this is ultimately how the hospital data portal works. So the hospitals um, go to a landing page here where they choose their organization and they click to log in. That's kind of key. So from the beginning, they're logging into something that limits um, what they can see. And it's not that we don't want you know hospitals to be able to see all the data. It's that one hospital can't see it's got to be HIPAA compliant and it can't obviously we don't want patient information available to one hospital if it's not relevant to them or they, the patient's not in that hospital. Uh, so they go to this landing page here and get, have sort of the beginning of what I'm calling permission based access to bring them to a limited set of, of data that they need. Uh, from there, they have access to survey one, two, three, where they're filling out record they're submitting records as either a patient admission an update to an admission record or as a discharge record to let us know that um, a patient has left the hospital uh, and with that there's a lot of information that's provided all the demographics that need to get into the state database um, uh, where they live, what kind of uh, residents they have, whether they're from a skilled nursing facility or a other congregate living setting, or whether they live in a private residence, whether they live in the county or out of the county, um, and then a lot of epidemiologic and, and clinical data. So whether that patient got COVID from somebody in their household, or whether they had a known exposure to somebody, or whether it was from the community or unknown, um, all of that information gets tied on here by the hospitals to, to each admission. And that goes directly into the uh, Oracle database where uh, us here at EMS and public health can connect to it and sort of analyze that day in, day out to, to uh, validate the ReadyNet numbers that come into the dashboard and that we, we project out to the public and to, to change our response and better understand what's going on out there. Um, but beyond that, after so hospitals log into the landing page, they end up getting to a space where they can submit patient records, update records, discharge records, um, and that's great. So that was a really big tool to come in and allow us to collect data from hospitals. The challenge there initially was that they need to be able to also see that data. So we got this running quickly, the survey, um, but knew that we would have to continue building it out. It's hard for them to know when to update a record. For instance, if a patient is in a med surge bed today and they move to an ICU bed tomorrow, 
and they've got a lot of patients. So they needed a way to kind of better keep track of what the status that we knew of, what our status for each of their patients was on any given day and help them make sure their internal records and our records were aligned. So the solution to that was um, an individualized dashboard that uh, for each hospital that references the or points to the Oracle database and projects the current patients that are in the hospital to that hospital's um, infection prevention staff so that they can see who they need to discharge, who they need to update, who they haven't admitted yet, um, and make, make any necessary changes to help keep that data accurate. Um, and for them to even understand and get some insights as to what's going on um, in their hospital in a way that 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 maybe they didn't have readily available prior. Uh, ultimately, all of that data comes to us here at uh, EMS and Public Health. Our communicable disease team works with it and initiates contact tracing. Um, a lot of times, sometimes we we go that team um, will see a patient that gets admitted to the hospital. <clears throat> And they uh, they will go to update that patient's record in CalReady or enter it. And oftentimes there's already a record there. The electronic lab record hit the state database and that patient has some information there, but usually it's not comprehensive. It's not all the data that's in there. So they're updating the record to keep that a little more updated and um, more helpful to us. Um, but oftentimes they also, that patient's not in there at all yet, in which case this was a real advantage for, that patient would have ended up in there, but it would have taken some time. So um, a little faster update to the CalReady database is a huge advantage to this. Um, and ultimately of, of what we were able to replace the process of the CMR, that paper form, getting faxed over or emailed over to um, the CD communicable disease team and then put into the uh, CDPH database, this process is now much more streamlined and it's given us more accurate data. And that dash, those these dashboards all serve to help hospitals kind of manage what what we show going on with their patients at any point in time. And this these dashboards show a good bit of um, patient information all housed securely on the database in the Oracle database. But um, here, this is a sample of what that looks like. And again, we'll go through. Uh, We'll go through that online here in a moment. <clears throat> so that's sort of, that's the overview of what we've had going on. It's been, um, it's a lot of simple solutions, but they're working really well and are in some really instrumental places where, where you can't really have a solution that doesn't work well. And, and they've been working great. So, so we're very happy with that. What, the one big thing in terms, I'm more on the operational side of this whole situation than the epidemiology side. Um, and one huge, huge benefit to that that I know a lot of counties don't have is that real-time data picture. The fact that every day we're able to project out to the public and to uh, stakeholders today's number of patients in the hospital and and then tell you who they are. We don't, I mean, we don't put that information out, but we know who they are and where they came from and we know enough about them to dig into that and and try to help sort of mitigate the situation um, is pretty huge. I think largely beyond that, um, another key to this is that we have a structure. We went from, oh man, what do we need to look at and how do we figure this out to? We've got a lot of structure now in place so that when the next problem, the next issue comes up, whether related to COVID and or the next problem, we have a lot of structure there and a foundation that um, helps us kind of on the fly switch over and look at different data or look at data in a different way um, while still maintaining the reliability of something we've been doing for, for quite a while. With that, unless there's uh, questions or anything, Cole, or if, if uh, you guys know of anything, I glossed over yeah there was a there was a question from paul um he was asking about um the dashboard on ventura county recovers and um, just what the differences are between these that we have and that one similar uh they are the same thing in terms of the data 
it's just a different tool. That's a Power BI dashboard that's on that. And that's uh, kind of for a number of reasons that ended up there first. And it's been our, um, actually it wasn't the first. First there was a, a ArcGIS dashboard done, done by the OES team. And then that came with some problems that, not problems, it was a good dashboard, but in keeping it updated was, was uh, there was excessive labor to that it was it was a pretty manual process the power bi process is is very automated so for that reason power bi ended up as the public dashboard pretty quickly um and the plan has been to shift now back towards something from uh gis we just haven't quite gotten all the way all the way there yet and and then there's also challenges with things facing the public that if you change anything, people notice and they don't they don't usually love it. Um, so so that's part of it as well. But um, same data, it's pointing at the same sources and this whole same process is it's using the same tools. It's just a different uh, different uh, tool to project it to the to the public. All right, great. Thanks. In response to that as well, there's I think it's like page four or something of that dashboard. Um, is basically what this this operational dashboard is kind of is uh, more so ours. <laughs> the like the public may not care about this quite as much, but we do in managing the system. This is kind of our um, shrunken down version of of that and it's it's basically the same elements as what's on the healthcare system preparedness page of of that so that's that's part of it as well um so the let's see So here is the actually I'll start with the survey here. So this is a this is the dashboard that hospitals would be looking at. Um, these are probably our real numbers from today, actually. Um, so if you've looked at the public dashboard, you would know that we don't have 56 patients currently in the hospital. Um, that's true. So we may have more now, to be honest. We may have more admissions since um, since that those re, re, polls that that were uh, projected publicly came in this morning at a, at uh, before eleven o'clock, um, so we this is one indication to me just looking at this that okay tomorrow might be a bigger day, but this data is also a little bit delayed. Remember, it's much more in depth in terms of what they're giving us. So each time they're submitting a new admission record or or discharge record, there's a lot of a lot of information that goes along with that. Um, and so it takes a little more time. So, so sometimes we'll see this currently admitted number here go up, and it's an indication that tomorrow's number on that other uh, public dashboard will be higher. Um, other times, if this is just a little bit of a lag. By the end of the day, they'll be closer to each other, those two numbers, and and it's because there's discharge records that that haven't haven't been submitted quite yet because hospitals are working on it right now. Um, but otherwise, this looks pretty accurate in terms of our actual numbers. And the way, remember the whole goal of this dashboard is to tell a hospital so we can filter by the hospital so if i pick one hospital here um, and i'm working at this hospital i can now look and see who my currently admitted patients are whether they're on a ventilator or not as far as ems and public health know um, they they know from their internal records whether that's the case uh, who's in the icu and who's receiving acute care. That's important. That on occasion, we will move patients to the hospital um, for the sole purpose of isolating them. So if they live in a skilled nursing facility or some congregate living setting, um, then if they are potentially not, if there's any, if there's a risk, if we assess that situation and feel like they cannot be adequately isolated in that location, then we will oftentimes facilitate and coordinate 
them being admitted to the hospital for pretty much the sole purpose of being isolated from the rest of their very usually quite at risk uh, group of residents. So when you see over here on the right side, patients currently receiving acute care, that's what that's referencing. Those patients would not be receiving acute care. And that's a pretty big thing for us to monitor um, only because if that number of people who are only in isolation at the hospital goes up, which at times it's gotten up pretty high, that can paint a really different picture of what's going on in our in our hospitals and our communities if you assumed all those patients were actually sick enough that they needed to be in a hospital. So that's the goal here um, with this dashboard is to give each individual hospital a view of who's in their hospital, who's on a ventilator, who's in the ICU and who's not, the level of care patients are receiving, and then give them just a little bit of um, information overall about total admissions, discharges, and the dispositions of patients down here on the left. Where this all comes from, again, is that patient survey or the uh, survey one, two, three tool that we're using, which I'll show you here. So this is what hospitals would be filling out to um, submit a record, whatever hospital it is. We have eight hospitals in the county with really five, um, uh, yeah, five kind of key systems, I guess. So admission records, if they're admitting a new patient to the hospital and this is the first time they've told us about this patient and they're COVID positive, then they fill out all this data here, which is from the paper form that we replaced before. Um, survey123 has been a pretty darn good tool in terms of being able to build this survey in a way that was had um, some rules to it and uh, for instance, if symptoms are selected, then a whole list of symptoms comes up. Um, if they say no symptoms, then that goes away. That's a small thing, but it's pretty key. Um, leaving those available for everybody to answer without that rule there has given us bad data before. It's just been something where maybe they fill it out and they shouldn't have. Um, but. I'm telling you probably most importantly is that the workload on hospitals right now is enormous. The amount of organizations asking for data and the amount of data we're all asking for is a huge, huge ask. Things like not having all of these questions show up every time they open this are, are important to kind of lessen their workload and increase the buy-in from, from people who are using this tool. Ultimately, without that, we, we, we don't have much. Um, so we get lab data, what kind of lab sample was taken, when was it taken, positive, negative, we get an attachment of the report, uh, we get epidemiology data here submitted telling us um, how that patient got it if they know. Um, we have information regarding comorbidities and there's lots of them once you click yes there. And then we have what's what's been interesting recently to watch and actually um, and, and for me, being more of a clinical performance oriented person, that's interesting thing to watch uh, is COVID specific treatments. And, and we're starting to be that back to some extent to the disposition of patients. Um, we're not fully doing this yet because it's been a it's been a, a build out process, but I'm very excited for the time when we can take this data. We have accumulated enough numbers to be something a little more meaningful and tied in the outcomes of patients and their their pre-existing or their comorbidities and age and and that sort of thing to sort of project back to hospitals a, a better picture of how how um, of data that may impact their clinical decisions or clinical performance when patients are if a patient's already been admitted then they're telling us they need to update a patient when something changes they moved to the icu they got intubated um, put on a ventilator they have a new treatment they're being given, um, whatever it may be, they use that tool for that. And then when it's time to discharge them, here they go. They let us know that patient's no longer in the hospital and ultimately what happened to them. Um, and, and oftentimes if this is a patient who died, um, this is oftentimes the first time we hear about it. It's usually neck and neck 
our, 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 our epidemiologist team has a, a, a process for being alerted about these deaths within 24 hours. Um, so usually it's kind of uh, a, a neck and neck race to see who hears about it first. But this, but my point being, this is a pretty darn important process. Sometimes we have not heard about these COVID positive patients before, and it's the first and sole source to get data into um, the state database and ours. And sometimes it's the first to tell us about these deaths. It's important. It's important that we get accurate data, and it it really helps us do what we what we what we do. The uh, I'll show one the last thing here, which is um, ArcGIS Insights. So this is kind of the like I said, one one um, one great thing about the this entire effort has been that I think Ruth said it in a previous uh, session today is that what's kind of made this work. Um, certainly the 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 wide range of of tools to accomplish simple tasks that are available both from from yeah, from from Esri and from things that GIS integrates with, like Power Automate, like we were mentioning before, um, and Survey One Two Three. So that set of tools, but it's it's also I think everybody in the count like different departments in Ventura County have worked together incredibly well as a team and been responsive to each other and. And it's been a really cool thing to be a part of and a thing to see um, through since since COVID started, really. Um, so I think that's pretty neat. And that's been a key part of this. And it's it's awesome to say that we have something to show you today that is an integral part of what we're doing that is not a finished product yet. I mean, that really what that's telling us is that we have a solution was needed to at least do the base job of getting data from hospitals, letting us do some amount of analysis on it, and validating data we were getting from other sources. And it did that job within about two weeks. There was a whole lot more work to be done, and I'm sure there's a million other ideas the GIS team has and that I have to, to make it the best application in the world. But it was up in a week or two doing its job and has just gotten better and better since then. So what you're seeing on the screen right now is sort of the next phase of that, which I mentioned before, which is uh, mostly these three up here on the top, just looking at um, admissions by people's age group, um, helping us better understand who these patients are when things change or things increase, looking specifically at COVID treatments. And we've got a new one today. So for a long time, our um, we had another data process. We, we were, as EMS, we were distributing remdesivir from the state to hospitals. We had to use some amount of data to sort of prioritize which hospitals got that medication. It was a trial at that time. Um, and that medication became helpful and good. And so for one, by being able to, like you're seeing here, the watching the cumulative total of patients receiving any of these medications, right? Um, has replaced other things that we had to do, like monitoring how many hospitals were using the remdesivir we were giving them and that sort of thing and figuring out who to allocate it to, um, but also will allow us ultimately to, to really provide some good feedback to the hospitals. And we do that now, but the next step will be to integrate this and, and more analytics right into that dashboard so that they're seeing it every day uh, and the data they're looking at is not only limited to their patients, but also aggregated countywide um, information. So that's sort of the next goal. And we've done that. Um, we've done a lot of that with uh, external tools, Power BI connecting to the GIS data. Um, but what you're seeing here is in ArcGIS Insights, which is kind of an exciting new tool we just started working with um, to, to see what's possible in here to to sort of take the place of um, what we were doing with some of those those external tools. So I'm excited for that moving forward. Nicole, I think that's I move quickly through things, but I think that's about the overview of everything. So if if there's questions or anything you want, you'd like me to go back and talk about, um, I'm open to to any direction. 
I think more clarity on the question from Paul, right? So he was asking about the data that is, uh, I mean, uh, the report or the Power BI that is in Ventura County recovers um, versus what we have on the GIS side. So uh, I clarified that there is no more lag, lag time like when it was built by OS, the first version of that, remember, maintaining the data. So yeah. can you talk a little bit more for clarity on that one? Um, yes. So let me know if this if this accomplishes that for you. Um, basically, the the our the whole process of getting data and the entire system you you I've just kind of gone through of uh, data going into the Oracle database, the transformation processes that happen in there. Um, and then the ability for both ArcGIS and for us at Public Health to connect to it, that's all the same. So this, this um, let me pull it back up. So this dashboard here, for example, is looking at the, the same data in the same source as the one that's projected publicly. The so we're just doing it with a different tool. Power BI lives over here on the public health side of things, but points to that same Oracle database and uses the same data that's that's that we talked about. Um, it's just being projected via Power BI to that public page uh, instead of this uh, GIS tool and a dashboard to, to present it. Does that? Is that clear? I feel like I did not answer that question very well, but I'm not uh, not sure if there's something more specific. Essentially, the the ReadyNet data, this individual hospital data, our data from our epidemiologist, um, all of this data feeds both the the dashboard you're looking at on the screen right now, as well as the public dashboard that you're seeing on, on VC Emergency. The only difference is that the uh, at this point in time, the dashboard you see on the screen is not public facing. Actually, this exact dashboard never was public facing, um, but a version of it could be. And the, the Power BI one, which we made early on and then has evolved was was made public facing since that was a readily available solution at that point in time. Yeah, and there's a um, call. There's another question, I think, um, on the. Oh yeah, yeah. So another question here from CJ. Um, she's wondering how much daily time are you spending on GIS data management, and also how much of a time savings do you think has the new tools provided so i can touch on the gis data management side of things um, each day we go in and pull the new records for one of the hospital dashboards that is this dashboard you're seeing here and that's the the redinet data and that um, for me I, i've just started picking this up, so I'm a little slower than the rest of the team, but there's um, Eric Alger and Richard Pascal are very quick at it. They can get it done in about 15, 10 to 15 minutes. But then there is the hospital dashboard that we update three times a day. And that can take between, uh, that takes about 30 minutes for them. If it's, uh, depends on the, the volume of how many patients were entered using that survey one, two, three form. But uh, about 30 minutes each time, maybe a little more, depending on how many patients are entered. And that's a big, that's a big time savings. <laughs> we, if we were to try to do manage that same process on our side, that would be all of our time. And, it, mm -hmm. and it's that we're able to use that to, to figure out what this data kind of means to us a little more. 
Yeah, and and think about data as if like first you can't build this without profiling your data. I think that's the critical part of it, right? We profile the data. Once we get the the profile of the data that we need, we define the process, right? The process would be cleansing the data. That's usually. Uh, happens, right? Because you want to make sure that the data is accurate. But doing that to five different sources, you know, multiply that with five different sources. Think about how much work and how many people you would need to do that. And then from that, after you cleanse, right, all of this are what you think about it, a lot of people who are probably ITU, you extract the data, you transform the data, then you load the data, and then you enrich the data, but multiply that with the number of sources that you have. I think just, you, you can you can see if I'm going to spend half of my day from one data source and multiply that by five, then I will not be sleeping. But if I'm doing it by myself, right? So you got to have a tool, a process, a method to do that. And then if it becomes repeatable, we're going to have to automate it, right? Because there are automation process. In GIS, there is what Richard uses, a, a, a data, data builder, right? A model builder. But also, you can write a Python script when it becomes repeatable, you can write a script to automate that. Now, from the IT perspective, if you want to automate this, think about it is like you're extracting from the data source, you're moving it to the destination. Once it gets to the destination, you need to do a transformation of your data. Then from that, you're going to automate it. There are what you call the SSI package, complete uh, you can put you can have a hundred SSI package and then you group that into a job as a scheduled so all of that at, at some point can be automated provided that it's a repeatable process and you know that the accuracy is there so right now the only thing that we don't let go is the cleansing part right Andrew because we need to make sure that we look at the data Act, you know, okay, this data is out of the ordinary. Go, let's look at it. That's kind of like what's what is the manual process, right? Not semi manual. I think it's a semi manual, but the rest, it's 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 pretty involved. But we use tools. Yeah. You have only Andrew on your end, and versus my team would run things three times a day. They take turns, right? Imagine without. Without the tools, you would need a lot of people, or you probably not even get the data, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> You're not gonna have anything. You're just doing things in paper. It's impossible. Yeah, right? it takes a whole, a whole team for sure. I see. I, it looks like it was answered, but I can see the chat now, so I have a kind of more clear answer on our, our view of Paul's question. And I guess just to go back to that, that. You summarize that perfectly, Paul. Yes, the sources are the same. There's no lag time on either one. Um, just different formats for the actual report or tools to project the report. The I see that the death note. Which where was where was that that you saw this? It caught my eye only because people people catch a lot of uh, anomalies in the data, and there's and I. Um, there's always an explanation, and I it it um I always want to give that to people, but there's always an answer there. There's always an explanation. I I do know it's complicated to look at though if you're not working with it. Yeah, what I saw was that uh, uh, several times looking at the at the uh, the BI data the from the um, recovery website. Um, uh, for example, it on one day it would say, okay, we we've just got a new death. And then looking back and comparing to what the uh, BI data was showing for deaths, they the increase in death didn't happen or happened um, like 20 days or sometimes as much as um, uh, 100 days or more before that. And I'm going, it takes that long for it to get out. And, and, and if so, that seems to me like it. Um, uh, if we had, you know, five deaths, 10, you know, three months ago, uh we don't really have a, something to be excited about today today yeah. it was we should have been excited about it 
three months ago. Yeah. Um, that's a perfect perfect point. So there, I don't know, it would depend on the specific case, but but there are, um, deaths are particularly tough. So we, I think, I think it's within 24 hours that we have to be alerted of them, but we have a decent number of cases where they have, those have to be pretty closely looked at to, um, and the physician kind of has to give us their, their ultimate answer as to whether COVID should be the considered the cause of death there. And, and then we have a decent number of cases where that person maybe was allocated to another county. And then ultimately it took some time before, before it was sorted out that that person who died actually maybe had been in a different county or a different state for some uh, kind of intermediate period of time, but their primary residence was here. Uh, there's some there's some unique circumstances where that uh, takes some figuring out. So it would have been something along those lines. On the average death does not take doesn't shouldn't be taken that long. The other other thing I'll point out is, and that's with any data you're looking at, is that um, we in general are showing the number of cases by the date that that person was tested. So when we give you know, however many new new cases today, that in fact is from includes people who have been tested over a, a pretty big period of time, and the and the um, that's reflected in in sort of the charts that are that are on that as well as in uh, Ashley's uh, sort of daily emails and and Facebook posts and stuff like that. But yeah, there's there's some nuances to the data that are important to understand. So there are times whenever um, uh, people get tested and then it takes a while for the uh, the people who tested them to actually fill out that form that you were showing on on survey one, two, three and get it in because maybe they're busy or they're. So it's a, we have in general, like our mainstream hospitals and our big clinics and whatnot, not a problem, but we have some outlying smaller clinics and 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 uh, groups that are not or or like let's say a doctor's office or or urgent care that's not part of a larger group like um clinicas there's clinicas everywhere but let's say we have a, a a single um instance of a place some of those tend to be more delayed before that data gets to the state first and then also gets to us so it's it should be a small number but in in those types of instances, there can be some delay before we hear about it. Um, and the other factor is, if there's any question about where somebody actually lives, which you know, with thousands and thousands and thousands of records, it's going to happen. Um, then, then those will oftentimes be delayed a little bit before that's finally sorted out, kind of who they belong to. I think there's a question for you, Andrew, too, from Jackie. Was was there any pushback from, do you see that in the chat yeah, box? Yeah, no, there has, has, has not been at all. Um, I don't know, I would have to kind of defer to to our Aaron, our epidemi Aaron Slack, our epidemiologist, to, to give you a perfect answer about what their requirements are with this, but um, there was there was not an issue. It was, it was a, that was a smooth process shifting there. And I think that, the, like, like that data doesn't go directly to the to the state. It's it's I think we're relatively free. It's sort of on us to appropriately use tools to get that data. Um, I don't obviously it would have to be compliant, like secure and compliant. There's got to be some sort of uh, regulation, but I don't think they would be closely um, concerned about what exact tool we use. Okay, great. Um, if there's any more questions, um, let us know. And uh, yeah, if not, I think we'll uh, close it up here and do our final trivia and say sayonara on a <laughs> great GIS day. Yeah, thank you, Andrew, because, oh, I think um, Richard is about to say something. Yeah, I'm finally going to chime in on something here. I just want to say that <laughs> That's so from the quiet. data standpoint on this, um, it's been a challenge to uh, see the data, analyze the data, but it's for a for a greater cause. 
I mean, that's that's the thing that is happening here. There's something that's happening in the state, our county, the country, the world that we were not really prepared for. And I just want to give a shout out to Andrew for bringing this to us. But I also want to give a shout out to the people behind the scenes that you're not even hearing about. We have an Oracle database uh, person, Sri Latha, who has been very supportive in our needs of getting a database stood up, getting user accounts set up. Um, that's critical in us being able to get this information back out and being able to do our work. So while GIS is is being like the hub right now, I just want to know there's lots of parts that pull and make GIS powerful. And that's what you're taking advantage of here. And like I said, I just want to give a shout out to the people, some in the back end, there's database people, there's network people, there's security people, and all of that was a requirement to be able to use survey one, two, three in a secured manner so the data was secure. The Oracle giving access to Andrew to be able to see the Oracle tables. All of that is important and it's just not GIS is, uses so much of technologies that we rely on other people. And like I said, I just want to give a shout out to everybody for that. Well said, Richard, absolutely. Yeah, it, it, as uh, the GIS really, we got to the point that we really have to work with everybody uh, within ITSD, outside ITSD, and it really takes us into a different level of collaboration to make everything, to make us successful and bring value to the county. I think that is something, you know, that is something unique, I think. Um, and also, I think uh, Aaron and, and Andrew for giving us this opportunity because, you know, something never done before. Uh, at this level of complexity and involvement. And and of course, Richard, <laughs> Richard and team spent so much time on the first two weeks. Remember, Andrew was saying first two weeks. Maybe we, we sleep uh, a little bit on the first two weeks. <laughs> but it's a, it's a great, great solution. <laughs> so, and uh, okay, let's go do the trivia. So... Oh, I just I wanted to also thank you, Richard, because it, it's not just get a process in place for processing this data. It's continually looking for opportunities to automate it, which Richard has done an amazing job, especially on the ReadyNet side, to make the processing really quick. I think we've got it down to just a few minutes versus much longer, closer to an hour in the beginning. So thank you, Richard, for being a model builder expert. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, but uh, I've already worked data on expert. Python. <laughs> yes, yeah, right. I'm working on a Python script that will automate it completely. Yeah. So we won't even Kudos, have to yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We're preparing for Andrew to work even. The system will work for you at night. That's what Richard is trying to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. All right. Um, Eric, All right, your, I've got uh, one one final trivia question. question. So fire up your your Google searches. Um, <laughs> this one's going to be related to agriculture. So most of you hopefully are aware that uh, the number one crop in Ventura County is strawberries, uh, and it has been I think for a while. But the number two crop in 2019 I think was a little bit of a surprise. Does anybody know what the number two crop in 2019? No, good guess. No. No. Close, Richard. <laughs> no. Oranges. No, still not seeing it. It is green. I'll have to give you a hint then. What did you get this research? There it is. Aaron, yes. Excellent. So Excellent. <laughs> according to the uh, Ventura County Ag Commissioner crop report for 2019, celery came in at number two with 243 million. 
uh, beating Lemons out, I think for the first time in a while at 211 million. And then uh, Strawberries is number one at over uh, 500 million. So good job, Aaron. We'll be in touch with you. And thank you to Esri for donating those licenses. Much appreciated. Uh, thank you. This thank is you great. Thank you for participating. Yeah. Yeah. First um, event, digital. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, uh, Richard, Eric, Cole, and uh, Krista, Leanne, everybody. I don't think they're here right now, but I wouldn't take them. And thank you for attending. Thank you for all the questions. OK, Cole, you want to stop the recording? We'll make all the recording available online. We'll work on that tomorrow. And you have to show me where I record mine, because I couldn't find it. <laughs>